Today, our topic is about Chiari diagnosis and treatment options. We are pleased to have Dr. Robert Bohensky, a neurosurgeon at the Mayfield Clinic and the Mayfield Chiari Center. Dr. Bohensky has been with Mayfield for over 10 years and has treated many Chiari patients. He is fellowship trained in complex spinal disorders. Now I'd like to turn the mic over to Dr. Bohensky. Thank you, Krista. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. Here is a brief outline of the topics we're going to cover today. What is Chiari malformation? What are the symptoms associated with Chiari malformation? What is the best way to diagnose Chiari malformation? What are those criteria? What are the treatment options? How is surgery performed? What are the risks of surgery? And what are the expected outcomes? At the end of the session, we'll have time for questions. So the basic anatomic definition of Chiari malformation is when the cerebellar tonsils drop or descend below the foramen magnum by five millimeters or more. Normally, spinal fluid flows from the brain to the spinal canal and is driven by the engorgement of the brain with blood during the normal cardiac cycle. If the Chiari malformation is going to cause symptoms, then the tonsils will plug the opening uh, at the base of the brain to the spine like a cork being driven into a bottle. This creates a pressure differential between the brain and spinal cord and sends an external pre pressure wave down into the spinal canal. The inability of the brain to get rid of the extra pressure during the cardiac cycle when the brain normally fills with arterial blood causes headaches and a myriad of other symptoms. In addition, the pressure wave that descends down into the spinal canal drives fluid into the substance of the spinal cord through small spaces around blood vessels known as Virchow robin spaces. This results or can result in the formation of a spinal cord syrinx in some patients. Since the spinal cord controls everything from the neck down, a syrinx can cause a variety of sensory and motor strength related symptoms that can lead to permanent spinal cord dysfunction. In some patients that are severely affected, a form of quadriplegia can develop. Your brain and spinal cord float inside the bony skull and spinal canal, bathed in a fluid known as cerebrospinal fluid, often abbreviated as CSF. This fluid is created inside the ventricles and then circulates up and down between the skull and spine. If you follow the arrows on the illustration, with each heartbeat, CSF flows from the ventricles and out into the subarachnoid space between the brain and skull. Again, follow the arrows. CSF drains from the fourth ventricle into the cisterna magula, magna and circulates down into the spinal canal and around the spinal cord. So the Chiari malformation blocks normal flow of CSF. In general, the skull failed to develop with enough space to accommodate the cerebellum and tonsils. The tight corridor forces the tonsils to herniate into the upper part of the spinal canal, resulting in obstruction to the flow of spinal fluid. This is a spectrum of disorders that ranges in anatomic severity. The basic principle, however, is that CSF flow from the brain to the spine is altered by the, by the malformation in such a way that symptoms can develop. Obstructive flow of spinal fluid is critical, is the critical identifying feature that makes Chiari malformation symptomatic. If it can be established that a patient with a Chiari malformation has obstructed CSF flow, then they are a good candidate for surgery. If they have good CSF flow, then patients are not good candidates for surgery. In patients with Chiari malformation and good CSF flow, observation is recommended and alternative causes of, or symptoms or the symptoms are sought. For example, migraine headache or tension headache or other forms of headache. Chiari malformation comes in a few different types. Type 1 is the most common type and the one found in both children and adults. Because the back of the skull is too small or deformed, a crowding of the brain stem, cerebellum, and tonsils occurs. As the tonsils push out of the skull opening and pass through the frame and magnum, they press onto the spinal cord and block the flow of CSF. 
Type 2 is a more complex deformity and is present at birth and affects infants. It occurs with the birth defect myelomeningocele, a form of spina bifida. When the spinal canal does not close before birth, some of the spinal cord protrudes like a sac from the baby's back. Both the brainstem and tonsils are pulled down into the canal to block CSF flow in the brain causing hydrocephalus. Symptoms can include trouble swallowing, gagging, high-pitched breathing, a, uh, a weak, weak cry, arm weakness, and developmental delays. This type is correctly called Arnold Chiari malformation and is, large, and is restricted to infants. Type 3 affects infants and is a rare, severe hindbrain malformation that involves the cerebellum. can develop with the birth defect encephalocele as shown here, a fluid-filled sac at the back of the baby's neck. The true incidence and genetics associated with Chiari malformation are not known. The incidence is estimated to be between 1 in 1,300 to 18,000. A gene for the Chiari malformation has not yet been identified. However, Chiari malformations do tend to cluster in some families with an incidence of 3 to 12 percent. The signs and symptoms of Chiari malformation are protean. It is important to remember, however, that Chiari malformation may not explain all symptoms that a patient may have, even if the symptoms are consistent and commonly reported with Chiari malformation, such as headache. This is because some of the symptoms of Chiari are not solely specific to Chiari malformation, and many other more common disorders can cause similar symptoms. Patients may harbor sleep apnea as a separate disorder from Chiari, especially if they harbor the typical physical features of obstructive sleep apnea, such as obesity and pharyngeal soft tissue laxity. Similarly, patients with Chiari may separately suffer from typical migraine headaches or common tension type headaches, just like the normal population would. Symptoms do range and most commonly involve headache, neck pain, balance, sleep problems, swallowing and facial pain, numbness or weakness or tingling in the hands and feet, memory problems, concentration problems, vision problems, fatigue and depression. Diagnostic tests for MRI usually involve getting an MRI scan, a standard MRI scan uh, showing a profile view of the very middle of the body is most optimal for evaluating a Chiari malformation. A, lawn can, a line can be drawn across the foramen magnum and the descent that the tonsils have uh, descended into the spinal canal can be measured. Typically, most Chiari malformations are identified when the tonsils descend more than five millimeters. These are several examples of patients with Chiari malformation showing the different degrees of tonsillar descent. In all of these cases, it appears that the tonsils are not only descended, but also likely obstructing the flow of CSF at the opening at the base of the skull, known as the foramen magnum. A normal MRI is inset at the top of the slide for comparison. The area of interest is shown here on the normal MRI. An abnormal MRI is shown here where the tonsils have descended into the spinal canal. You can see that they're actually taking up too much space between the front of the spinal canal and the back of the spinal canal here. This is a more severe form of tonsillar descent shown in this picture here, where the tonsils have actually descended below the first ring, um, actually to the second ring of the cervical spine. Another helpful test for diagnosing Chiari malformation is known as the SIN MRI. This is also referred to as a CSF or cerebral spinal fluid flow study. The uh, videos here demonstrate what normal flow looks like across that junction known as the frame and magnum at the base of the skull. 
the area of interest is shown here on the normal slot on the normal uh, CIN MRI. The abnormality is also shown here where the fluid is blocked and the fluid cannot be seen sloshing back and forth between the brain and spinal canal. This is a key study in the diagnosis and treatment of Chiari malformation. This test is a good way to establish whether or not, flu whether or not flow is obstructed enough by Chiari malformation to warrant surgery. Some cases are fairly black and white with respect to either good flow being present or no flow being present. More research, however, is needed to better understand the significance of various levels of diminished flow. The question that is being researched by our group and others is just how much flow reduction is necessary to predict a favorable outcome from surgery and perhaps identify other patterns of altered flow that may be significant. Clearly, more research is needed in this area. In some patients, CSF flow obstruction can lead to the development of a syrinx, which is a more serious finding as permanent damage can occur to the spinal cord if left untreated. This condition is known as syringomyelia. In some cases, permanent damage has already occurred by the time the diagnosis has been made and surgery recommended. In these cases, the purpose of surgery is to halt progression of the disease and hopefully in time reverse the effects on the, on the spinal cord but improvement varies from patient to patient as far as this goes. Overall, about 65% of patients with Chiari malformation may be found also to have a syrinx. It's also important to know that syringomyelia can also occur in patients without, without Chiari malformation and have a different underlying cause, such as tumor or trauma. The symptoms of syringomyelia, syringomyelia are also uh, fairly broad. Again, it's important to remember that some of these signs and symptoms associated with syringomyelia are not necessarily specific to Chiari or to a syrinx. For example, numbness and tingling in the hands and feet as an isolated symptom is much more common, commonly due to another disorder, just as, such as carpal tunnel disease or peripheral neuropathy or even to a simple medication side effect. Even anxious states can sometimes cause numbness and tingling in the hands and feet. Therefore, it is very important to investigate all potential causes of these symptoms with your doctor. And to remember that Chiari malformation is, is only one potential explanation for these types of symptoms. Common symptoms, however, associated with syringomyelia include loss of sensitivity, especially to hot and cold, and a cape-like distribution of sensory changes over the shoulders. Muscle weakness, difficulty walking, headache, pain in the neck and, and extremities, and loss of bowel and bladder control, as well as curvature of the spine known as scoliosis are common symptoms. Treatment options include observation, or watching and waiting monitoring the patient's condition, and determining when the optimal time is to operate. Surgery is recommended for patients with significant symptoms and clear evidence of blockage to CSF flow on MRI and Cine MRI studies, or in patients who clearly have evidence of a syrinx in the spinal cord. Common symptoms, again, are posterior neck pain and headaches when straining, swallowing or vision problems, difficulty walking, incoordination, arm and leg weakness or numbness, and sleep problems, such as snoring and sleep apnea. Observation uh, uh, can include medication for headache relief, ranging from the simple over-the-counter type medications to medications that require uh, a specialist to administer, such as a uh, dedicated headache neurologist. There are many other types of uh, non-surgical modalities that can also be utilized to reduce symptoms and improve overall general health. In terms of activity limitations, because of the nature of the anatomic structure at the craniocervical junction or base of the skull, 
Uh, it is recommended that patients avoid high velocity neck or chiropractic manipulations. Uh, types of activities such as jumping on a trampoline or riding roller coasters that can apply a significant g-force to the neck. Contact sports, diving, or any type of activity that may prevent or present an axial or impact load to the skull. Patients should avoid straining during bowel movements and treat coughing and sneezing episodes um, as best as possible. Lumbar puncture should be avoided as they can bring out Chiari type symptoms and in some cases even cause Chiari malformations. Natural childbirth um, uh, may need to be modified and this is something that can be discussed with a uh, childbirth specialist. Surgical indications for Chiari malformation require tonsillar descent below the foramen magnum blockage of CSF flow on cine MRI and static MRI images, and symptoms that are very compatible with the diagnosis of Chiari malformation, and also the presence of a syrinx in some patients. The goal of surgery is to relieve symptoms thought to be caused by Chiari malformation. It is important to remember that surgery is not expected to cure all symptoms a patient may report and it is helpful to establish a realistic expectation for symptom relief and to understand that a patient may still have some residual symptoms that need to be managed conservatively or by other means or ascribed to a different or separate disorder. The goal of surgery, however, is to, the structural goal of surgery is to repair the mechanical obstruction at the base of the skull and to restore normal CSF flow across that junction. Again, these are a series of pictures that depict that restoration of flow at the base of the skull. The main goal of surgery is to restore this flow and generally almost always involves removal of the bone at the base of the skull. Uh, the, this bone is called the occipital bone. It is universally accepted that this, that this bone is generally removed. In some patients, it may also be necessary to remove the C1 or parts of the C2 vertebrae, depending on the nature of tonsillar descent and the overall shape of structures clustered at the frame and magnum. The amount of bone removed and the need to remove C1 and C2 is largely then dictated by the shape of the individual tonsillar abnormality in patients and to some extent by physician style and choice of approach. Once the bone is removed and the dura incised, a small patch is sewn in place to further create room for the tonsils. More than the exact manner in which the surgery is done, in other words, whether or not C1 is removed, whether or not there is a dural opening, and whether or not a patch is sewn in place, it is most important at the end of the day that the goal of surgery is achieved, namely restoring flow at the frame and magnum. So I'll now present a basic outline of how the surgery is performed. There are seven basic steps involving skin and muscle incision, removal of the bone at the base of the skull, removal of the spine bones if necessary, opening of the dura, arachnoid dissection, and sewing in, a, sewing in of a patch. Of course, this is then followed by closure in the standard fashion. A small strip of hair is shaved along the incision. Skin and muscle and bone, sorry, skin and muscle uh, uh, incision is made and dissection is carried out down to the base of the brain. Neck muscles are retracted just enough to expose uh, the suboccipital bone and the C1 ring. The blue area in this picture represents the area of bone intended to be removed through a Chiari decompression. Bone is removed to enlarge the foramen magnum. The amount of bone removed is typically referred to as about three centimeters in overall dimension, from side to side and from up to down. 
the exact amount of bone removed is customized to the shape of each patient's skull to optimize the restoration of normal flow at the foramen magnum. The removal of the C1 ring or the arch of C1, which is the first spinal vertebrae, may be required in some patients to reestablish appropriate flow at the foramen magnum. Some surgeons have recommended that the C1 ring be preserved as an, and as an alternative to removing the C1 ring, the tonsils may be coagulated or shrunk. In both cases, in other words, removal of the ring or no removal of the ring plus shrinkage of the tonsils, fluid must be restored at the cranial cervical junction. In most patients, in fact the vast majority, if the C1 ring is removed, it is not associated with any long-term problems or functional restrictions. In rare cases, it may however render the ring of C1 prone to fracture, but only a few reported cases of this have been identified. Next is to open the dura. In some cases, it may be possible to avoid opening of the dura by use of ultrasound after removal of the bone. If ultrasound shows that the tonsils are decompressed simply with removing the bone, the dural opening may not be required. This may be more relevant to pediatric cases where most of the reported work has been done. In adults, the tissues may not be as pliable and it is more typical to open the dura in adults and so in a graft than in pediatrics. Again, as long as one can confirm that CSF flow has been restored, then the goal of surgery has been achieved, whether or not the dura has been opened or not. This may account for some variation in how the surgery is actually performed. To go into a little more detail on this issue of ultrasound evaluation during surgery, an ultrasound device can be used to actually examine whether or not flow has been restored to the cranial cervical junction after bone is removed. In some cases, if adequate flow has been restored, the dura, uh, the surgeon can defer opening the dura and exposing the patient to the risk of cerebral spinal fluid leakage. Again, the technique is probably more appropriate for younger children whose skulls are still growing and who have more pliable tissues. One recent article has shown that tonsillar descent can be graded. Depending upon that grade of tonsillar descent, the dura may or may not be opened. In this video, we're showing a surgeon exploring the tonsils at the frame and magnum and lysing adhesions. and confirming that there are no blockages to CSF flow. Some surgeons prefer this direct visualization to ensure satisfactory decompression and restoration of flow prior to closure. In this video, the surgeon is using coagulation to actually shrink the tonsils. As I mentioned before, this is one way to perhaps eliminate or reduce the need to remove additional bone by physically shrinking the tonsils. This video illustrates the sewing in of a patch graft. The surgeon places the graft underneath the dura and then sutures it in place in a watertight fashion. This is similar to sewing a patch into a pair of jeans that has become too small in someone who may have gained weight. It provides extra room for the tonsils. This is a static image that actually shows the results of a sewn-in patch graft. 
and you can see that the tonsils have ample room in back of um, uh, that structure to allow the proper flow of spinal fluid. There are many different types of patch grafts that can be utilized, including tissue taken from the patient's own body, dura donated from uh, another person, or animal products. Personally, I have used several different types of graft material and have found them all to be quite satisfactory. The most critical technical issue here is not which graft material is used, but rather how well the graft is sewn in place. This is largely driven by surgeon style and preference, and there is not convincing evidence that supports the superiority of one graft over another in all hands. A poor result for one graft in one surgeon's hands May, may more likely mean that the surgeon is just not familiar with that graft or that his technique is not agreeable with that, graft, that particular graft choice. The take home point here is that it's not necessary to place a lot of emphasis on what type of graft is chosen by the surgeon, but rather the individual surgeon's results in utilizing that graft. Some surgeons also like to augment their repair with the application of a glue-like substance called fibrin glue. This is a form of biological sealant, much like roofing tar, and prevents leaks from occurring. The final step of the surgery is to close the wound, usually with sutures that are buried underneath the skin and do not require removal. In most cases, a super glue-like product is applied to the skin and serves as an external dressing. Hair can usually be washed the day after surgery. Recovery from surgery can take days, weeks, or months and varies from patient to patient. Headache and neck pain are typical after surgery and can usually be treated with medications. In some cases, patients can tell that although they have a headache from the surgery, their actual headache type has changed and that they may no longer have their Chiari type headache. During your recovery, it's important to avoid activities that increase pressure at the base of the skull, such as bending over, putting the head low, straining while going to the bathroom, or prolonged coughing or sneezing. Additionally, it's important to start some basic isometric neck exercises within the first two to three weeks after surgery. Most patients can return to work between two and six weeks after surgery, depending upon the type of job they may have. Usually, we recommend a follow-up Cine MRI to confirm that satisfactory flu fluid flow has been restored six months to one year after surgery. It's very important to have appropriate expectations from the surgery. Recovery from the Chiari syndrome can take, again, months or longer, and returning to normal activity is a gradual process. It's important to slowly increase activity to avoid strenuous lifting and maintain a positive attitude. It's sometimes helpful to keep a symptom diary and to share with your surgeon so that questions can be appropriately addressed and answered. As far as complications from the surgery are concerned, a leakage rate of approximately 5%, a spinal fluid leakage rate of 5%, is fairly typical. For a good surgeon, that leak rate should remain less than 5%. This refers to the leakage of spinal fluid that can occur through the wound after surgery. A cerebrospinal fluid leak has the appearance of almost a tap water-like fluid draining from the wound. This is something that needs to be addressed right away. Alternatively, the leak may be internal and a pseudomeningocele can form. This is not necessarily an external leak, but the, and the collection may be under pressure and also may require surgical intervention. An infection rate of 1 to 2% is typical. Major complications should be less than 
and transient complications like worsening of headache or swallowing difficulty may occur in up to 20 percent. The results of surgery depend on the severity and the extent of previous brain and spine injury. 70 to 80 percent of patients have meaningful symptom relief. By meaningful, I mean an improvement in symptoms that allows successful return to a productive life. Headache and neck pain often respond well to surgery. So do brain stem signs like swallowing difficulty, facial pain, voice changes, tinnitus, eye problems, and dizziness. In some cases, sleep apnea can resolve. Numbness or tingling of the hands and feet may resolve. If there's been a syrinx, an injury to the spinal cord, these symptoms may take longer to resolve. Assuming that the surgery was properly performed, reasons for not improving after surgery may be the unrealistic expectations, confounding comorbidities, such as the presence of other diagnoses that may explain the symptoms, or an incorrect diagnosis or attributing symptoms to another coexisting condition in the same patient. Overall, about 50% of patients may become symptom-free and 10 to 30 percent more may have significant uh, improvement. 10 to 20 percent may not have substantial improvement. For Chiari patients with syringomyelia, the size of the syrinx usually does shrink and does indicate that the, that the Chiari surgery was performed successfully. However, despite shrinkage of the syrinx, 50% of patients may continue to have residual symptoms related to damage that has been permanent in the spinal cord. Recurrence of Chiari 1 malformation is uncommon and is thought to be due to factors that may interfere with CSF flow dynamics, such as scarring of tissues, inadequate bone removal, subsequent neck or head trauma that may result in scarring or an alteration in the anatomic structures. A tethered cord may also be a reason for recurrence of symptoms. There are many reasons why some patients may consider their surgery unsuccessful or failed. Again, it's important to have appropriate expectations. Failure of some symptoms to get better does not always mean failure of the surgical repair. Rather, it may mean that other causes need to be sought for some of the residual remaining symptoms. Persistence of symptoms may indicate other, other uh, disorders being present, such as migraine, tension, headache, or neck muscle strain. Many of these types of disorders are successfully treated with medical intervention. Was it the wrong diagnosis? Was the Chiari the cause for the headache? It's important to remember that other causes of headache must be ruled out before headaches are attributed to Chiari malformation. Overall, the Chiari malformation is a very uncommon cause of headache compared to other non-surgical headache syndromes like migraine headache. Technical failure of the surgery means that CSF flow was not successfully reestablished at the foramen magnum. And this is one of the key features that we look at in patients who have persistent symptoms after Chiari decompression. This is always assessed by the use of a postoperative MRI and a Cine MRI test. Remember that the Cine MRI looks at the actual flow of fluid at the foramen magnum and skull base. If CSF is found to flow well at the foramen magnum, then the surgery has indeed been technically successful and other causes of persistent symptoms must be identified. Sometimes rehabilitation is all that's needed to help improve symptoms. Re-exploration may be undertaken only when post-operative testing proves that CSF flow has been obstructed. Failure of surgery 
can sometimes mean that not enough bone was removed to relieve the compression. Again, the Cine MRI may be helpful in this regard. Too small of a dural patch or not enough bone removal are common causes of, of persistent or residual Chiari malformations. For some patients, Chiari is a chronic condition that can have profound effects on quality of life issues. Lifestyle changes and alternative therapies are important for symptom control, both before and after surgery. The goal of surgery is to restore CSF flow and stop progression. Empower yourself with education and realistic expectations, and you will have a good outcome from your surgery, if indeed you have Chiari malformation. Seek care from an experienced Chiari team and neurosurgeon. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We're now going to answer some questions that have been sent in by our registrants.